Hello there, my name is Andy Ford and I blog at A Red State Mystic and I am once again back with the beautiful and gracious Mother Lori Brock of Dirty Sexy Ministry. Thank you. Uh, a quick apology to the viewers and, and also to Mother Lori as I've already uh, profusely apologized in the last three minutes we've been talking. Um, I downloaded a program, didn't realize I had to pay for it, it only recorded five minutes, didn't tell me it would only record five minutes. So that's why we only have five minutes of our last, what was it, 45 minute conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sounds about right. So, um, so she has most graciously uh, acquiesced to, to coming back and doing another one and I am thankful for that and thank you for your time. You're very welcome, my pleasure. Yeah, so uh, last time, uh, the, the last video ended with me asking a question of you explain the difference between dirty ministry mm. and sexy ministry. And just to recap, if I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but sexy ministry is the stuff that you're really proud of your church. You can bring it out at a party. People, it impresses people. Mm -hmm. um, and dirty you ministry. It on paper, you know, yeah. it looks good on the resume. You can talk about it at, at clergy gatherings. Like, look, you know, my church did this and this, and you know, and it's good ministry. It just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got it's, you know it's it's kind of like the it's the to me it's the difference between knowledge and wisdom i ran across a quote probably on pinterest i love pinterest <laughs> um, but you know that knowledge is what you learn and wisdom is what you experience and and to me you know sexy ministry is kind of that thing that you know we all kind of you know um I don't know that learn is the right word, but it just looks really good on paper. You can talk about it in, you know, social circles and people nod. And, um, and I, you know, in a lot of ways, I think sexy ministry is doing ministry to other people and dirty ministry is doing ministry with other people. That's how, to, how, how I would put it in one sentence. Um, and dirty ministry is almost not anything that you can put on a resume. Yeah. You know, it's just not, uh, the 20 minutes that you spend maybe sitting with a person who just walks in your office because they just need to talk to somebody and maybe they're not even members of the church and you might never even know their name. I mean, um, that's, and I think that is inherently the ministry that we're called to. I would say crucifixion is a pretty dirty ministry. No one wants to do that. Yeah. No one wants to do that. We're all big fans of the resurrection. Like we all want to be there on Easter Sunday, yeah. but you know, there's a reason that good Friday services are not really highly attended and Easter Sunday is packed. Yeah. So. I, I have uh, medieval tendencies as I'm sure you've recognized from yes. my, my blog. Um, I, I'm all about the crucifixion. I think, I think the bloodier the Christ, uh, the better, but that's beside the point. Um, you were saying uh, before the recording stopped, you, I asked you to share an example of a dirty ministry and a sexy ministry from this last week or some recent time. You know, I, I was talking about how uh, our parish had two funerals a, a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and both of the funerals were people who were sort of the tan what I call sort of the tangentially related to the church. You know, they had come at some point, but, you know, haven't been active members for several years. But people seem to know that when they are grieving and when they are sorrowful, that churches hopefully are safe places to be part of that liturgical emotional experience. And, you know, and I just think about how many parishioners stepped up at St. Michael's to make sure that the parish hall had tablecloths on the tables and flowers on and flower arrangements and it was all clean and that there was food there for the families after the service so that they could gather and share their stories. Uh, people who didn't know any of the family members volunteered to be uh, readers and ushers and to make sure that the doors were open and that the church was clean. And I think that those, again, that's, you know, the quintessential ministry of the church is that very small, almost quiet outreach that is almost unknown. You know, I, I kind of call it church mouse outreach. You just don't know that it's going on, but yet you know if it's not happening. And, you know, I think I look at some of the ministries that we have in the Diocese of Lexington. I mean, I think there's so many of them that are really out there. I think that when, you know, we do, um, you know, food food drives uh, to gather food for like on St. Joseph's Day and those we have those. I mean, those are those are really good ministries, but they look good, too. You know, we can pile up our food on, on the tables and say, wow, you know, we're donating this. Um, and it's it's not that, you know, I think that our inherent the criticism I've heard about that distinction is that people think sexy ministry is bad. And it's like, no, 
it's only, you know, all ministry is bad when it seeks to serve your needs and not the needs of somebody else. Yeah. So it's not that one, it's just one is, you know, one plays prettier than the other one. And one is a little quieter and a little more discreet. And quite honestly, most people don't ever know uh, it's going on. And, and I think inherently all good ministry is just ministry done because there is a need there for it. Yeah. Are you, are you familiar with uh, Therese of Lisieux? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, she, I think, um, I'm not as familiar with her as I am with the, some of the other saints, but she talks a lot about doing, uh, loving God and the little things. Absolutely. And I think even like scrubbing the floor of the convent mm-hmm. is one of her, one of her acts of love to God and to Absolutely. her fellow man. Absolutely. And I, and I think part of the call is to recognize that everything we do in our lives is ministry, you know, uh, I mean, I know those days that I've had where the phone rings and I'm just about this far from walking out of the office and it's been a long week and something makes me pick it up and it's somebody, you know, I need to talk or, you know, and I just think that is ministry. Even though I'm tired, even though it's frustrating, that's ministry. So. Yeah. Could you give an example of, it sounds to me like you're saying your whole life needs to be ministry. I think you may have even said that. Um, what's one example of how, you minister to someone in a way that you didn't expect? Does that make sense? That you didn't anticipate? I, I'm fairly convinced that all the best ministry is not expected. Um, you, you know, I, I think when we sort of go in with something and we have a plan, um, whenever we start to have plans, that's a pretty sure way to sort of edge God out. Um, uh, so I, I think all the best ministry is really unexpected. Uh, and, and all the best ministry also ministers to you too. Uh, so I don't know that there is, um, you know, I think it's the, one of the things that I, my congregation hears me frequently say is all of life is a prayer. You know, it's not a matter of saying, well, I'm going to allot this 10 minutes a day to pray. Now I may allot 10 minutes a day to be intentional about verbal liturgical prayer, but yeah. all of life is a prayer. Um, and if we start to just kind of see that, if we start to shift that, you know, it is ministry to stand in the line at the checkout counter and recognize that maybe the person, the cashier is really tired because she's dealt with cranky people all day. Uh, and just to smile at her, uh, to, to recognize ministry is shopping, is there's a ministry in that. You know, buy what you need. Uh, be a conscious consumer. Um, buy local. I mean, all of these things relate into living, you know, as a part of the whole instead of what do I want? What do I want to do? What will make me feel good? You know, it's the I, me, my, mind part of, of life, which actually has gotten, I think, quite a foothold in the church. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, the book is titled Where God Hides Holiness. Mm-hmm. And uh, last time we joked and I asked you what, you know, uh, why is God hiding holiness? Yeah. And you, you gave an explanation about the title. Would you care to give that one more time? Uh, well, I can say, you know, if you want to find out where God hides holiness, buy the book. Uh, <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Uh, you know, I think it's that we, there seems to be, in my experience, this idea in the church that holiness is something that we strive for. That's an exterior and an external um, event. Like, I have to have this particular type of, of prayer or liturgy or music, and then I feel holy and, and good. And I think the surprise that Mary and I both discovered in those three years, which we write about, is that holiness is really that most authentic, most naked place within us where God resides. Not, you know, it's not something that is, you know, has to be acquired. It, in fact, you know, I, in fact, I was doing some edits this morning and, uh, you know, and I, and I ran across the line that I said, God is the God of diminishment, um, that God is the God that pulls away and pulls away and pulls away. So I don't think it's that God you know, hides holiness um, as much as, you know, God puts it in a place that requires us to do a little work to find it. Um, and I'm sure there will be people who go, God does not hide holiness. So don't send me emails. Everybody gets to have their own opinion. It's the title of a book, not a theological statement. Um, but I also think that we only see holiness in pretty things. That's, you know, you know, I've heard people talk about how, you know, they, oh, I see, I see God in the sunset. And I was sitting in this beautiful church in Europe and there were all these stained glass windows and it was beautiful. And God is certainly there. But I think God also 
you know, where we are fearful to look for holiness is in the really awful stuff in life, the grief, the brokenness, the sadness. And I think that's where God is holy. I think that's where God is. And we're very frightened to go in that place and find it because it means we have to take some really hard looks at this brokenness in ourselves that we all carry. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's an excellent point. And one of my frustrations is that, you know, as someone who reads and watches movies and opera and all of that, is I find beauty, uh, and I don't want to use beauty and holiness synonymously, but, you know, mm-hmm. I find I find beauty in those, like, the nitty-gritty of life experience. As we both talked about, we're both opera fans, mm-hmm. um, someone's going to die. Someone's always going to die. Someone's going to get to have a high body count. The higher the body count, the better the opera, I believe. That is, that, that is so true. That's my, that's my motto. Yeah. Um, and so I get frustrated when when I'm told by people of in our time that, that beauty is only found in these kind of ethereal, non-nitty-gritty, because I think the more nitty-gritty it is, the more beautiful it is. The more it digs deep into, into the soul, mm. into the the darkness, the shadow, the, the, the farther it digs into that, the more beautiful it becomes. Absolutely. So when, uh, you know, Madame Butterfly sings her final aria before killing herself, because she's been, she, you know, was led on by this, that son of a bitch Pinkerton, sorry for swearing, um, that, uh, you know, it just makes it all that more mm. beautiful, more expressive. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is, you know, one of everybody's favorite, you know, hot science geek, uh, he talked about it, and I and I take this out of the context that he talked about because I heard him speak when I lived in New York. And uh, but the my hearing of it was that people frequently say, you know, well, I believe in God because I look at you know the mountain, the majestic mountain ranges, or I look at the beauty the beauty of an ocean. And and he said, you know, can you look at the decaying body of an animal and see God? Mm. And and, and, and he said, because there are people that do, there are people that can look at that and say, wow, you know, this is being broken down by the natural processes of, of the world. And it is becoming nutrients for, you know, other animals. It is becoming life giving to the soil, um, you know, and, and it was just really, that was one of the first times I ever thought about how we really keep God trapped in anything that's pretty. We don't really like to see God in this, the starkness, the barrenness, the brokenness, the grief, because it's hard to find that takes some work. You know, you don't see God in those places because you just woke up in the morning. It, you have to really dig into your own soul to be able to see God in those places. You know, and I caveat this where I do not, do not, do not believe that God doles out trials and tribulations on people so, because it's a slow day in heaven. I just, you know, and again, my congregation hears this, you know, I have the list of questions that I'm going to ask God. And, you know, one of the things, why is life not fair? Why is life hard? Well, it is. I don't know. I mean, nobody asked me how I would run the universe. I would change a few things. Uh, But life is hard. And and there's tragedy and there's heartbreak and all of that happens. And God is in there somewhere. Um, And I don't, you know, I don't think that we do ourselves any favors to side into the whole belief either that um, that if something bad happens, you've done something wrong. Sure. Sometimes you have. I mean, I sometimes find myself in situations that I can be like, well, yep, I, I was the one. Who took- <laughs> it is, you know, and I think that's sort of the whole idea about where God hides holiness is really not that where God hides it. God just also puts holiness in a place that most of us don't want to go digging around in. So we put it there. And it and it's sad because it stays there covered up um, and lost our whole lives. I mean, we all know people that never dig into their wounds. And then they become old and mean and uh, nobody likes to be around them. So that's my experience, too. <laughs> so what what are ways that you have ministered to other people and told other people and you yourself uh, have been able to dig into that, that place, that dirty, that dirty place within yourself? Not willingly. I'll tell you that. Uh, I, I don't really think anybody says, well, gosh, it's a slow day and <laughs> I'm going to put it on my calendar, dig into the deepest broken spaces of my soul. Uh, yeah. 
you know, I don't know that I can actually speak to how I've ministered to others in that place other than just being present. Um, that's generally their story to tell. I, you know, I can say that one of the reasons that Mary and I ended up writing the book, which, again, was kind of an unexpected thing, was to share our story about living three very difficult years where we both experienced an enormous amount of grief, an enormous amount of betrayal, uh, feeling like the churches we were serving uh, were not safe places for us. And, um, and having, you know, and having to resist that urge to just say, well, it's all somebody else's fault, um, you know, and to say, what has happened here? You know, and for both of us, you know, we finally had to get rid of that good girl persona that all good Southerners have. Um, because Mary and I are both Southern and all that Flannery O'Connor brings to that, we bring to that. And uh, to start to say, you know, what is it? What is it we want? You know, what is it in our wounds that uh, that uh, that we are called to be something different? I could not be the priest that I am today without what I would without what I went through the, the, those three years. Now, I wish I could have taken the correspondence course <laughs> instead of having to live through that. But I didn't get I didn't I didn't take that path. So. Uh, um, I don't know if that really help, that's really a good answer. I, I don't know that there's a, you know, it's a hard it's a hard story to tell without the complete context of it. But you know, I think there's that moment where I remember, and I write about this in the book, where I literally am. I mean, because you know, drama has never been a Southern girl's enemy. Where I literally am uh, laying on the in the graveyard at a monastery, and I just realize how. I so much of my life that I have put together and pieced together, I have done because I thought it was what I was supposed to do, but it really wasn't made, what made my heart sing. And to do what made my heart sing meant that I was going to have to disappoint people, that I was going to have to speak my truth, and that there's going to be a cost to speaking that truth. Um, there always is a cost to speaking that truth because I think there are always people who don't want you to speak it. Um, and there was a cost to that, uh, a very high cost. But um, I've got some nice scars, and uh, they, they, but I still look good in a strapless dress. So I'll just <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And I think that rings true in my own experience, and I'm not interviewing myself, so I won't share any of that. But I, that kind of realization that there is something that, that is within you and that's within me, and then we have to let it out. Mm -hmm. um, and doing what you're supposed to do seldom accomplishes that. Oh, uh, Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, could you give a little bit, you talk about the, during those three years of trial of, mm -hmm. as uh, San Juan de la Cruz would say, you know, that, that kind the of... dark night of the soul. The dark night of the soul. Yeah. Well, could you talk a little bit more about that? What it was like for you? Uh, well, I have... Um... You know, I I ignored it a long time. I uh, my my dog just walked in to say like, what are you doing? Talking to the wall? Are you, have you lost your mind? Uh, I, you know, I Mary and I both talked about how we both and, and we were both in the same diocese, so we knew each other, and that was part of just the survival was having somebody to go through that with. And, uh, you know. I think that there are occasions in our life that we sort of get dropped into the woods or the great deep or the tomb, however, whatever image we want to use, whether it's some tragedy that happens, death of a spouse, something like that. Um, I actually felt like I kind of took one step at a time into the woods. Um, I just kind of kept going down a road. And then I just remember kind of that moment where I realized, oh, this is, you know, this doesn't feel really safe. You know, where am I? And I love, I love that poem, The Road Less Traveled, because I actually have this in the book. I said, the reason the road is less traveled is that people look at it and they see the bones of the people that have walked on it before and go, no way. Yeah. Like romanticize that whole process. And it's not, you know, it is not romantic. It's not comfortable. It is hard. Um, you know, my, I, I have a very strong body, mind, spirit connection. So during that time, I lost 30 pounds. Wow. Um, and it wasn't that I wasn't eating. I just, my body was just like, I was waste, I was spiritually and physically wasting away to nothing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, you know, I have lost my ability in many ways to get angry. And I, I can, you know, again, the whole scene is in the book about where I finally realized 
I need to get angry. And boy, I was really glad I didn't have anything around me then. Um, because I was, but it felt so freeing to finally claim all that I could be angry about and should have been angry about. Mm-hmm. Um, I also profoundly learned that when anyone is on that journey, when anyone is on that journey of grief, of sadness, of self-discovery, of descending into the great deep, none of us, none of us has any expertise about what that person is going through. And one of the things that still, you know, when I think about it, still makes me very upset is how many people gave me all of this unhelpful advice. Oh, that's so true. and, and 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 it wasn't coming from their own journeys. I mean, it wasn't sort of one of those like, here's my experience when I lived through this. It was, well, this is what you should do and you should do and you should do. And, and, and and all that did was just make me feel incompetent. And it also made me feel like their entire, you know, my entire role was to make them happy. Mm -hmm. Isn't about, and I can remember the blessing it was to have my friends, Mary and Brad and some other really close friends who just listened, who just said, you know, we trust you. We love you. Tell us what you need. We will listen. We will listen. We will sit with you. Um, And that is so important. So I mean, one of the things that really came out of that is when people are in that process, it is not my job or anybody else's to say, well, here's what you should do, because that's always out of our own pain and, and, and discomfort with it. It's never, it's never helpful, but I still, you know, that's kind of one of the things that really caught me and still does of, of how and how abusive that felt. Mm-hmm. Have people say, well, you just need to get on antidepressants. Now, yeah. hey, you need to be on antidepressants. That's all well and good. Mm-hmm. I don't know too many clergy who also have medical degrees who are able to make that call. And I didn't work with any of them. Yeah. Um, but it just kind of felt like that. And, uh, and so I think one of the biggest things I take away from that is – People's journeys are their own. Um, it's not my job to manipulate it. Um, it's my job to be present as I am asked to be present. Yeah, th- I think that's excellent. And I don't know if I've experienced it to the depth that you have, um, but in my own dark night of the soul, I I would get advice from everything like, you know, talk to a therapist, quit reading books. That was one of my favorite ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, quit quit watching opera and things like that. And then, you know, have you gone for a walk today? You know, yeah. and like, yeah, yeah, these are all, all things well and good, but it, it is very, very offensive. I don't think they're well and good. I think they're invasive and, and I think they are, they're invasive. And, you know, um, uh, Arun Gandhi quotes his grandfather by saying that the most prolific acts of violence are unsolicited advice. Oh. You know, unsolicited advice are acts of violence to other human beings. Yeah. Uh, now, there is nothing wrong, I think, with sitting with somebody if they ask and say, this was my experience. And when I went through this, you know, I I had a therapist, I had a spiritual director, you know, I, you know, I did whatever you did. But always make sure to add, you know, everyone's journey is his or her own journey. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it just it, it really that was really painfully apparent to me was was that. And I think, quite honestly, people who are fearful of making that journey on their own, who have resisted that dark night of the soul, are the ones who will most hurriedly try to get you out of there because they don't want you in it because they're not doing it. So, you know. That is is so true. And in my own experience, that's exactly uh, dead on what I have experienced myself. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things I always like to think about as you talk about how to minister to others and to yourself in, in those dark spaces. Um, I always think about Mary, uh, Our Lady, and uh, mm-hmm. St. John. Um, they were the best ones at the crucifixion. And, and of course, the, the, I think there were women there also, who they didn't do anything. They didn't try to stop them. They didn't bear the cross. They didn't stop the soldiers from, from, uh, from piercing his side. All they did was stand there and watch and mm-hmm. weep. And... For me, I think that is that is what I am. I, I don't want to talk too much about me, but I feel like that's what I I am called to do is to stand and watch. That is, and that's so hard because I think our our natural inclination and it's always kind of about our own needs. Uh, 
I love, is it uh, Frederick Buechner who has the quote about vocation is when your great gifts meet the great needs of the world? Yes. Well, my, my uh, twist on that is most of us think vocation is when our great needs meet the great needs of the world, mm. uh, which is called codependency, you know, <laughs> and uh, it, it's, really, it's really striking to me how desperately uncomfortable so many people are with, with seeing people they love and care for in pain. Because I, I really, you know, in I, now a couple years out of that whole experience, one of the things I do think is that what was done to me, I don't think was done out of, of meanness mm -hmm. and out of, out of, I think it was done because they were so uncomfortable with seeing a colleague in pain. But they didn't voice that. You know, there's there's the voice. You know, there's the courage. Gosh, I'm really uncomfortable seeing you in this place. Sure. And I wish I could do something to help. Yeah. You know what? That's a really wonderful statement to make to anybody who's in that place. Um, but, you know, I think about how many people we have who, who I mean, what is one of, one, of one of the first things we hear whenever somebody has lost um you know, broken up with a boyfriend or girlfriend or, or gotten divorced or, or lost a spouse to death or partner to death. You know, it is how long, you know, is it before somebody says, well, we got to get you back out there. You know, we got to, you know, you got to date again. You got to get back in the saddle. And I always think, why is that our business? Mm -hmm. You know, why do we not just trust somebody to be in the space that they need to be in? Yeah. So. I think that's very well said. Um, I, I think I have a new title for your blog. Okay. Um, please feel free to use this. Um, and I only want to be quoted whenever you use it and okay. like in a retainer, please. Um, dirty, sexy mysticism. Ma. You I know what? I, I, that, that might be, I'm going to write that down. That might be actually. Uh, because I think exactly what you, you know, that's one of my interests, um, Christian mysticism. Oh, yeah. I, I think what you have described is is pure, wonderful Christian mysticism and wrapped it in a very sassy uh, Southern uh, 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 shell. And I love it. And I think it's great. That's what we Southerners do. We can just wrap something in sassy all. I like, I, to, fry, I like to fry mine. That's what I do. Yeah. So. Well, you can't go wrong with deep fried. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, I, you know, I think it is not surprising that if somebody, you know, when people ask me how, how has your spirituality and faith changed from, you know, pre, pre, you know, that time to post, I think it is that I've become much more comfortable with uh, mysticism. I, I am much more comfortable. You know, I meditate. I sit very quietly. Um, I do a lot of my prayers with artwork. You know, I, you know, I, I obviously verbally pray because mm -hmm. I'm a priest and that's what that's we what, do. So that's what we pay you to do. That's what we pay. That's what, uh, but I'm, I'm much more comfortable in that place uh, than I was you know, five years ago, which is just kind of five years out, but, uh, and that's, and that's actually a really kind of wonderful place to be. So, you know, and I also think that I'm more comfortable. I call it, I, you know, I call, I call sort of the best part of me, the wobbly one, you know, the one that really isn't quite so sure about where she is most of the time. Mm. But, you know, the great thing about being wobbly is you have a tremendous sense of balance. Mm. You no. Know? Write that down. That's good. Yeah. So, well, you learn that you learn that riding, you know, because the horse is not a fixed point. It's moving, <laughs> and you're moving, so you have to figure out uh, how to stay on that horse. So there's something you know, elegant about being wobbly, and I think that again, our culture doesn't preach that, and and I'm not sure our church does either. We we're not big at that point. We like we like sure and certain. Yeah. Well, just, yes, I agree, and. Uh... Wait, well, last time we talked a lot about your interest in horses, and I, I don't want to take any more of your time, but, but um, just so everyone knows, Mother Lori's a big horse rider. Like a cha she's like, she's like best friends with Ann Romney, I think. And uh, <laughs> yes, yes, it's it's true. And does and does. Uh, I don't do dressage. I don't. I don't do dressage. She, I don't she, have she to doesn't do dressage. I have but. patience for dressage. Yeah. Well, just uh, I thank you again so much for your time, and well, I just want to ask just a couple, few more questions. Okay. And these were uh, user uh, friends submitted questions. Submitted, yeah. Um, someone who wants to re remain anonymous, I, but I think she's a parishioner of yours, um, asked that if, if you were a castaway on a desert island and you had chocolate, um, a Bible, and a man, I think there was maybe something else that she included. Um, so all That's your basic rough. needs. 
Pardon? Mascara. That's it. <laughs> so all your basic needs are met. What yeah. one more thing would you take to the desert island? You know, I said when I, I, I said, I think in the first one that I would <clears throat> take a journal. I actually think I'd take my paints. Hmm. Um, you know, I just, I, I actually, one of the things that I started to do uh, during the three years was to draw with my left hand and I'm right-handed. So it's my non-dominant hand that I draw with. And, uh, and, um, I just, you know, that, that is that time of, of every day that I do that in my prayer life. And, you know, so I, and I never, I've always surprised myself with what I'm going to draw, but I think I would take my, my paints a lot like horseback riding that's something i do solely for me i don't display any of my art probably never will uh it's not something i show people like look at what i draw uh and i and i think that uh that that is a big part of my life now i would also take my cell phone because it would really be boring without you guys on twitter <laughs> yeah i would say um thank you I mean, I Call for help. Like I never get these. Yeah. You're on the desert island questions. I would call for help. That's what I. I would take a boat so I could get <laughs> off the desert islands. That's the other thing I would need. Not a boat. I would take a yacht. Yes. Because like we need to travel in style. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly. Um. And another question comes from uh, Rev Hoove. Yes. The Rev Hoove. Hoove. And uh, he asked a question concerning the zombie apocalypse. Oh, well, I, we had talked about that. I really thought that the church was sort of missing a whole uh, ministry opportunity here. I, you know, I, I think that we actually could, you know, we have the Eucharist, and why not have a zombie Eucharist? That offends me, but how would it look? <laughs> well, I, you know what? I actually think that we better read the Valley of Dry Bones from Ezekiel. Because you could have like the whole the whole thriller theme going on there. Oh. Like I know these look like dry bones now, but in a few yeah. minutes they're going to be dancing. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I probably I'm probably going to hell for this, but <laughs> you know, we are eating the bread and body and blood anyway. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not a little, but uh, I think we should do a zombie Eucharist. I mean, you could. We've got some great, great, you know. Uh, Gregorian chant that would sort of work very well with that because you know zombies are you know zombies are children of God too. <laughs> you know and I think we just need to have the rule that says no eating other children of God's brains during the okay. Eucharist yeah you know that's it but yeah um I'm like really fascinated with this suddenly big deal about zombies and vampires in our culture yeah. um and zombies have become this really scary thing like by the way if you're not watching The Walking Dead, missing something. Okay, uh, I have to get on that. Great show. Uh, but, you know, like the whole thing about vampires, uh, and, you know, they used to be really creepy, and now they sparkle. And I'd say I kind of like my vampires so creepy and mean, so. But, yeah, I think we should have a zombie Eucharist. And, but I think every priest then would need to know how to operate a bow and arrow. I think I talked about this, too. Shoot the zombie, you know, because some of the zombies during the, you know, the peace and how a kind of a coffee hour breaks out. Yeah. You really don't want to have a zombie apocalypse break out in the middle of the peace. So. Yeah. If you throw an arrow, it might in that. This is the kind of conversation that will probably get mailed to my bishop. Yes, I said it. Not the worst thing I've ever done. Probably <laughs> won't be the worst thing I've ever done. Um, I think it's great. Um, I think you need to write a liturgy. Um, I'm willing to help. Oh, that'd be awesome. And uh, we can uh, submit it to church publishing, maybe get it in the next book of occasional services. Holy or, women, holy men, because, you know, oh, they'll, they'll put anything in holy women, holy men. They'll put the zombie, the zombie Eucharist there. So, well, thank you. One of our uh, Twitter friends calls it ho hum. <laughs> what? Ouch. Well, maybe if it wasn't ho hum. I'm, I'm a layman, I can say this. Maybe if it wasn't ho hum, maybe they wouldn't have to say it. But, uh, uh yeah. Okay. So another quick question: uh, What what does the Episcopal Church do well, and what does it not do well? Um, I think what we do well is uh, we we provide a space for those emotions which don't have words. Um, our, our liturgies give form to those things which otherwise couldn't be spoken: grief, joy, um, mysticism, awe. All of that. And I think that's what our church does well. And we do it well because we don't have to reinvent it every two years. Mm. 
Uh, we build on a heritage that's thousands of years old. Um, I love that I pray prayers on Sunday morning that are 2,000 years old and some that I write two days ago and that all holds together. So I think that that is one of the things we do really, really well. Um, we, we allow people to be on the journey. And what do we speak at? <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, what do you think we do worst? We don't tell people that. Yeah. You know, I think that we are the wor our own worst PR. Mm -hmm. It kind of goes against the Episcopal ethos. I mean, we're, I feel like we're supposed to be really snarky and sarcastic and have a deep faith, but mm -hmm. don't talk about it. I feel like that's what Episcopalians do. Well, you know, I think some of that goes back to what we do well. I think we don't talk about it because how do you talk about something so amazing and awe-inspiring like God? Yeah. You know, I mean... I, if I try to reduce God to, you know, in four sentences, do you remember those tracks? I guess I used to be Southern Baptist. I remember like those little tracks they used to give us that had like the four points of faith that you Oh could yeah. Like the Romans road faith. and all that. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, you know, and I, and I read those and think, you know, I don't disagree with any of it, but you know, how do you put into words a faith community that brings you comfort when you were most broken? Yeah. You know, how do you put that into words? I don't know that you can. I mean, I think that the best of the Episcopal Church is experienced and not verbalized. Mm. And I think we're very uncomfortable in our culture with saying, you just have to come be part of it. Because it, it kind of sounds a little, you know, like we should be smart enough to be able to put it down in, you know, 200 words or less. Um, but I do think, you know, I think that, you know, I am most proud of, of being an Episcopalian when I can stand in a room or, or a worship service or a community and just simply be wherever I am. You know, I don't feel like I have to be happy. I don't feel like I have to be sad. I just can be where I am. And I, th and I think there's huge value in that. Yeah. And, and I think, I think actually the smarter we get, the less we'll be able to put those things into words. So I, I, I would agree with that. Well, thank, uh, thank you for that. And uh, one last quick question. Any um, last minute uh, a Archbishop of Canterbury nominations? Oh, are we supposed to have one yet? You know, that's sad, isn't it? That I like, I, um, I think I told you this. I think that uh, I have no idea. I mean, like, realistically, I think it's kind of so irrelevant in some ways to, uh, to, the, to the world as it is. Uh, we might need to rewrite that job description, which hasn't been rewritten in, what, 2,000 years? Something, yeah. 500, yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. It's been a while. We yeah. might need to think that job description. Um, a really good Archbishop of Canterbury. I'm, I'm still holding fast with, I, I think, the Liam Neeson character from Taken. You know, like, he just shapes the people up. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should be, I think we should be in fear of, of whoever the new Arch, like, like, whoever gets elected, it needs to be someone who we will all fear, you know, because they will get stuff done. I think it'd be just really fun to have, like, Indiana Jones as the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> like, you know, why not? You know? Yeah. So, like, obviously no snakes, but, hey, Ireland doesn't have any, so you're good to hear. <laughs> move, move Lambeth to Ireland. I, I don't know. I just, I, it's one of those things that I, there's a part of me that loves, you know, the wonderful romanticism of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, but the more, I guess the more mystical side of me says, you know, what, what is this person's call? And, you know, why are we so fearful of, of saying, oh, maybe we do need, and I think I said this in the last interview that I, I am very sad that Rowan retired and stepped down before he, I wish he had said, I'm leaving in a year. And then this last year, we're going to do some really serious uh, thinking about how this job needs to change mm. and how this role needs to change. Mm. Um, so. Yeah. Well, uh, I think this is our time. Okay. Um, I want to say thanks again to Mother Lori of Dirty You're Sex welcome. Ministry. Uh, find, you can find her blog by Googling. And uh, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, it's uh, Dirty Sexy Ministry, but it's what, D-R-T-Y-S-X-Y Ministry? Yeah. You know, I, I was just laughing about, you know, I told, we call our uh, blog site the most disappointing porn site on the internet. So, yeah. uh, and I don't know who it was I was tweeting with last night. It was one of us that we were saying, you know, how disappointed when these fashion places follow whoever this was. And he starts the Jesus talk. I was like, 
my blog's name is Dirty Sexy Ministry. Imagine the disappointment <laughs> I get when I start talking about Jesus. So, well, I, I I don't know if I've ever told you, but I like the number third, like number three or four search that my blog pops up pops up on is uh -huh. Carrier Pigeon. Because I reference Carrier Pigeon in one post, and it's it's like I've I've tapped an unmined group of Carrier Pigeon enthusiasts. I need to. It's, it's very interesting what sort of shows up following your blog, and and I you know I have people all the time say you know why did you name it Dirty Sexy Ministry, and I said you know you're talking about it, aren't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, it's we've gotten a lot of grief about it, but it's you know. I, I think I wrote in one of the blog posts about, you know, every every new priest should have the shocked and appalled file that you can just draw the list. So, you know, I was shocked and appalled about whatever you do. Yeah. And uh, and I said, and, and the quickest way to fill it up is to name your blog Dirty Sexy Ministry. <laughs> well, I, had, book deal, so. I had to stand in front of the mirror and practice saying it several times before the second interview because I just, I kept blushing the first time. You know, the best, gen I was at general convention this past summer, or this summer, and one of the best moments of standing there talking to a couple of bishops, and one of the, some other bishops came up, and they're, you know, all in their purple and being very bishopy, and, and one of them says, oh my God, you are Dirty Sexy Ministry, and I thought, oh, I wish, I wish I could have recorded that moment, because it's just kind of yeah. great to have that moment. Uh, and it's actually really flattering to see how many people read and follow and support the blog. And so this is my shout out time to all of the, you who have followed and, and supported us and shared our post and encouraged us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because there have been times when we wrote the blog where we were getting so much pressure from other outside sources saying, you don't need to do this. This is, you know, bad and awful for the church and all sorts of things that we, we seriously considered stopping it. At one point, now we're glad we didn't. But. Yeah. Well, we, <clears throat> as one of your readers, love it, and uh, thank you so much again for your time. And uh, we'll see each other on, on Twitter, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah. If not, you know, because you're, you know, you're not that far away. So. No, indeed. And I drive through Lexington. I'm from Indiana originally, so okay. when I go visit home, I have to drive through Lexington. So. Well, it's a cool city, so. Yeah. Well, um, I'm Andy Ford, and I blog at a Red State Mystic. You can follow me on Andrew N. Ford uh, on Twitter. And uh, until next time, hope you'll have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much.